I'm going to talk about uh, the situation in Norway and the control measures that we are looking at. Uh, I think the situation has been explained uh, very well by the speakers so far, so I will focus more on what we are doing uh, in response to this. So, so uh, in, in addition to the situation, uh, I will talk about the methods we have used so far and the, what we have learned from that. Uh, what we think is at stake here if we do nothing and uh, how we are preparing for 2023. It's been said already, but we have had an explosive population growth uh, the past generations of pink salmon. And uh, here's just an example uh, of uh, actual video monitoring. So th this is not catch, this is the actual uh, number of pink salmon that entered one specific uh, little river. And as you can see, uh, there was uh, a tendency already in 2015 of a rise, and then came uh, a big rise in 2017, not so big the next generation, and then it took off uh, in 2021. And I think it's also important to mention, this has been shown earlier, but we are looking at uh, like a slow wave moving westwards uh, when it comes to, to uh, rivers with uh, huge numbers of pink salmon. Strayers have been there all the time, uh, all the time since the, the Russian stock transplantations in 1956 we've had spraying. But I think what we are observing in the north is uh, self-reproducing reproducing populations and they are getting more and more larger and larger, and this is moving slowly, or not so slowly, uh, westwards and southwards. Uh, this is the area where I'm uh, working uh, normally, uh, the county of Toms and Finnmark. Uh, I have an office there uh, in the town of Vatsø, close to the Russian border, uh, at the county governor's office. Uh, but for this year and next year, I'm working for the Norwegian Environment Agency to, to uh, implement the national action plan, uh, make it happen. 98% uh, of the pink salmon catch in uh, 2021 was in this county of Troms and Finnmark. Uh, and you know, within this county you see also that it was uh, clearly uh, increasing when you came closer to the Russian border. These are uh, about 70 rivers, I think, uh, from west to east in this county. And uh, when we made this action plan, we said that we thought it was important to have uh, a real effort in the area of Varanger, east of the River Tama, in this area. But then after 2021, we see that there are um, there are uh, a lot of uh, rivers uh, further uh, west with uh, high numbers of pink salmon. So we need to expand the area of uh, the control measures. So what did we do in 2021? Or we didn't do it, it was uh, mostly volunteers. They, um, they took the initiatives themselves and they applied for funding and they applied for licenses to, to remove the pink salmon. Uh, the government funded a lot of this, but also uh, thousands, of, thousands of hours were uh, done uh, by volunteers with no uh, funding. And they used uh, the fish ladders to sort out the pink salmon. They used spear fishing, gill nets, seine fishing, and they used whales. I'm going to tell a little bit uh, how this worked out. So it's obvious if you have a fish ladder, you have the opportunity to uh, to uh, put in uh, to stop uh, every day all the, the fish, and and you can uh, just take out the pink salmon. But the problem with this, uh, it's uh, not so common that the fish ladder is close to the sea. It's often a flat terrain close to the sea, and when you come to the mountains, you have the fish ladder, and th that means that you will have several kilometers of river below the fish ladder, and you cannot remove uh, all the fish uh, by the use of this method. 
This is an example from the river Vestre Jakobsel. They uh, removed a lot, but they also had to use skill nets below this uh, fish level. And also you can see this is uh, terrain which is not so easy to operate in. There are no roads going down to this uh, place, so you have to carry tons of fish and equipment up and down these uh, mountains. So it's hard work, and you have to do it many, many days. When it comes to spear fishing, uh, it has been done for many years for pink salmon. Uh, before the pink salmon became recognized as a problem, uh, people were using harpoons and such to, uh, to remove uh, one by one. And it's something you can do if you have conditions like this. If you have uh, clear water grid visibility, it's a very safe way to remove pink salmon, uh, to, to go snorkeling and, and uh, take them out. But it's not very effective if you have uh, many of them, and especially not if there are more and more coming. You can be working non-stop and you will never reach your target. So it's more like a supplement. Gillnets can catch a lot of uh, fish, uh, and also obviously there's a high risk involved if you use gillnets in, in a river, in a salmon river. But as you can see here, uh, the, sorry, there is uh, one guy here with a, with a wetsuit uh, and a mask. So the first thing they have done uh, using gillnets, before using gillnets, is to swim and, and see if the pink salmon are uh, alone in the pool or if it's mixed with other species. If they are alone, it's okay to use gillnets. Um, there has been a big worry that this will give uh, unwanted bycatch of Atlantic salmon and other species, but that didn't happen. They were very responsible and careful. So uh, they mostly caught pink salmon and only a few accidents with the other species. But there are, of course, problems with this uh, as well. It takes a lot of effort. And uh, you, have to, you, you have to do this al almost on a daily basis. And in the end of the season, uh, when it comes towards the spawning time, you Maybe you have been uh, fishing out all the pink salmon in the lower part of the river one day, and two days later, new pink salmon has come from the sea, and they will start spawning immediately. They will not wait two to three weeks like the first one does. So you will not, uh, you are not able to respond and remove them before it's too late. They've already laid eggs in the gravel. So that's why gillnets are not uh, something that you can rely on when you have the numbers that we have. And in this picture also shows gillnetting, uh, and it shows you how many people you really need uh, on a daily basis to use this fishing method. All the black dots there are people uh, holding the net across the river, and there's another team coming down with a, with a second net, and they are forcing the pink salmon uh, to go in either of these nets. They can't, they can't escape, but they do escape, uh, a lot of them, either way, because they are able to go under or they, when 100 pink salmon, salmon go into the net simultaneously, the net will deform and they can get under. So, it's not the perfect method. Uh, Sane is a way to do it uh, uh, when you, so that you can uh, release fish. So you have, if you have mixed, uh, if you have a mix of different uh, species, you can, uh, with Sane, you can uh, only kill the ones you want to kill and let the rest go. But as you can see from this picture, a Sane has uh, a lot more drag in the current, so it's difficult to operate. Only in certain calm areas you can uh, do this effectively. So it's, it's also a supplement. So the weirs are the ones, the, the method that works best is our conclusion. Uh, this is a uh, homemade weir. You can see some cheap garden fence material and you can see some nets uh, that were used for mink farms uh, earlier. So this is really flimsy stuff. It, uh, it's not very robust when there is a flood. And especially if you have a lot of uh, leaves and grass and such, it will pick up uh, and uh, you will have problems keeping this intact uh, during the season. So to sum things up, uh, spearfishing is quite safe, but it's 
mostly a marginal supplement. The gillnets have removed a lot of fish, but because you have to be cautious, many things will avoid being caught and it's labor intensive, so not the solution. The same only works in certain condition, and we are going forward with these weirs. So the important thing is not how many pink salmon you have killed, it's how many survived or escaped to spawn. And here are some uh, rivers from the Varangian region. I'm just going to try to explain to you what happened in the different rivers. And this, this is the red bars are the spawning fish of pink salmon 2019, and the blue is the spawning uh, fish in 2021, counted by snorkeling. So we see that uh, on the left hand, the Tana, that's just a small section of the Tana. Um, nothing was done in 2021, and that means there were 10 times more spawners. In Skaldelva, uh, Vestre Jakobsel, uh, Vesterelva, the Naden, those rivers, they relied on gill netting, and as you can see, it was not good enough. There was uh, a high increase in spawners uh, from 2019 to 2021, even if they had spent thousands of hours with these gill nets and such. Especially with the Vesterelva, they removed more than 20,000 fish, and it's a small creek, small stream. Uh, still, there were maybe 10,000 left to, to spawn. Uh, they worked every day doing this, and they didn't reach the target. So, we need to do something else. Uh, Kumagel, over here, they had a bear, but they put it into the river too late. So, some thousand pink salmon had already ascended, and they could not catch them. Even if they tried, they were not able to catch them all. But then, uh, which I find some motivation. Uh, I will point at Klokkerelva, Munkelva, and uh, Karpelva. This one, and this one, and this one. They had some homemade wares that functioned uh, quite well. Not perfectly, but quite well. And as you can see, they didn't have this rise in, in spawners. Two of those three had less spawning in 2021 compared to 2019, and you can see the other rivers surrounding them having a much worse situation. And uh, in addition, they didn't have that rise in the number of ascending fish, so maybe we are starting to see some effect of, of these wear operations. On the right hand is the border river to Russia, and we are not allowed to do anything there. So that is kind of a reference river of the zero action alternative. <coughs> So after the spawning, we have been following uh, what happened to the eggs. And uh, in October, they had hatched. Uh, we found alevins. And in May, uh, like others have shown, there was a lot of smokes everywhere we looked. And this means that pink salmon is effectively reproducing in, the, in most rivers in northern Norway. It has become the dominant uh, species in many rivers in odd years. And gradually, we are seeing high numbers of spawners further west and south. So, we think it is possible that pink salmon can colonize all of Norway and other countries around the North Atlantic Ocean. That's what we believe will happen now if we don't do anything. And uh, we know very little about the negative impacts. Jakko, who spoke earlier, is quite right. We have almost no uh, scientific uh, work on this. We need to, to get that going. But we have this risk assessment also in Norway. And we, uh, we think that we have displacement of native species in the river when you have a lot of pink salmon. We know that the water quality can become very poor when high numbers of pink salmon die and decompose after spawning. The Russians are telling us this. 
uh, that that is that is already the case in the Russian rivers. We expect that there will be impacts on biodiversity when you have such big changes in nutrient load. There is also a fear of uh, disease spreading between fish farms, uh, pink salmon being a, a vector of viruses and, and bacteria, but we, um, we don't think they are bringing something new, they are just picking up and transporting um, the, the viruses and such uh, to uh, other places. And obviously it's negative for sport fishing and, and the related economy. So what can we do? We think that spawning can be controlled by sorting the ascending fish and denying the pink salmon access to the spawning habitats. We know we can do that. We have shown that we can do it in one single river. So it's just a question to, to scale things up. Copy and paste. Uh, of course we have a few rivers that are very large and difficult, but most rivers, we know what we can do. We know how to do it. Just need the resources, the, the, the funding to do it. We have a group of experts. They have been appointed to find the most effective measures. They have pointed at uh, different kind of wares which will be tested in 2022. I've already shown you this uh, homemade uh, type of weir. It's working in this kind of river, uh, quite shallow and, and quite flat terrain. So when you have a, a flood, the, the water level doesn't rise so much. It just goes wider. This works very well in this uh, location and it's cheap, but it doesn't work everywhere. This was a uh, unsuccessful attempt in the river, they have to give up. So we have to find better solutions. Uh, this is uh, an example from, uh, from Alaska, from Kodiak. They, they use uh, pickets of aluminium or, or steel. That is better than these nets. They, this picks up less uh, grass and, and leaves. But it's more expensive, of course. And we are also uh, testing these floating wares. Um, we have one already operating since 2013 in Norway. Not for pink salmon, for other kind of research, but it's working very, very well. And this will adjust to the water level. So if you have uh, um, changes in water level and rapid floods, uh, this will work very good. But it's expensive. We have ordered two of these from um, from an American company now, and it's uh, right now it's on its way across the ocean, and we are mounting it in uh, uh, and towards the end of the summer, so we can have some testing before the autumn and decide if you want to buy more of this. This is just some pictures from the production process, and it's not patented, so anyone can do it if you, if you just find out how. So it's a, it's a substrate rail. Um, which uh, is the anchor for the, the um, wear or the fence, the floating fence, and it's a trap box uh, with a pike on the upper left. And this kind of uh, fishing, or fishing method, is, it's not a new invention. It's been done all over the world for maybe thousands of years. Um, this is a picture from uh, river in, uh, in uh, Western Norway. It's the same that we are doing now. That time it was made by logs. But notice also that it's not covering all of the river. It's only covering a small part of the river. Because as long as we have had uh, laws in Norway, as long as Norway has been a nation, it's been forbidden to cover the river with such a fence. Because already in the Viking Ages and before that we knew that this was a very effective way of, of um, destroying a salmon population. So it's said in the very first written law of Norway from 1274 that uh, no one is allowed to do this. And if uh, someone does it, everyone living upstream, they are obliged to go and tear down this fence. And if they don't do, it also says how, many, how, how much money they have to pay to the king as a fine of not removing the fence. So, this is uh, old technology, we're just using new material. We know what we have to do, we know how to do it. Uh, we just need the, the resources. And we have this, um, we have a couple of large rivers we are kind of 
wondering how to deal with those, but I'm sure we can find a way to, to deal with those as well. So just summing up, we have effect, effectively reproducing pink salmon populations. They are growing fast, they are spreading to new rivers. The dominant salmon, salmonid in northern Norway now is pink salmon. We think it's a threat to the Atlantic salmon, to biodiversity and to water quality. But we will try to gain control of the reproduction in our rivers, we are trying. But if we fail, pink salmon may colonize countries around the North, the North Atlantic Ocean. That was it. Thank you.